Good afternoon. I'm Michael Markowitz, director of the Institute for Retired Professionals, and I'd like to welcome you to the New School and to this lecture, which is part of the series of lectures that we do for the community uh, three to six times a year, uh, and it's derived from a bequest by the Tolkien family in honor of Estelle Tolkien, who had been a student at the New School. I'd all like to give a special welcome to Marvin Tolkien, who's with us today. Marvin. The Institute for Retired Professionals is a group of students who are retired or semi-retired who come together to engage in serious learning. And we pride ourselves in the community that we've created into the studies that we focus upon, and we encourage you to investigate that. There'll be a sign-in sheet. Sign your name in if you would like to be, get information about future events. Put an asterisk near it if you want to hear more about the IRP. I would like to invite you to an event on December 11th. You're sitting on the invitation right now. <laughs> uh, and it will be an interesting lecture on the change in jazz as it moved from the clubs in Harlem to Carnegie Hall and the influence of uh, the, the change on people like George Gertzwin and Paul Whiteman and uh, the Marsalis family. I'd like to ask you, particularly since we are filming this, to please turn off your cell phones and other electronic equipment. It's nice when everyone, you see everyone standing up, bowing down. Uh, I would like to introduce two more people, Gloria Troy, wave in that back, uh, back corner, and Miriam Lawrence over there, who are chairs of the Friday at One Committee. Uh, they have done a wonderful job, and they have worked with a new committee for the fall, for the spring, we, and we will be back with fine, fine programs for you. Now let me turn the floor over to Miriam Lawrence, who will introduce today's guest. Thank you, Michael. Um, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Fred Plotkin. And when you're talking about Fred Plotkin, the word pre pleasure is a term of art, because Fred is a self-described pleasure activist. Um, he's a man of many talents, interests, and passions. He's a recognized expert in a wide range of fields, from classical music and opera to food and wine to just about anything related to Italy. In fact, in a Public Lives profile in the New York Times, Fred was described as one of those New York word-of-mouth legends known by the cognoscenti for his Renaissance mastery of two seemingly separate disciplines, music and the food of Italy. Later, the Times described Fred as a New Yorker with the soul of an Italian. Over the course of Fred's career, he has worked at both of the world's premier opera comp companies, both the Metropolitan Opera and La Scala. He is the author of nine books, including such standards as Opera 101, A Complete Guide to Learning and Loving Opera, and a similar volume, Classical Music 101, both of them published by Hyperion. And I was happy to learn that Fred is now working on a 10th book, a biography of Michelangelo. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, the LA Times, Opera News, Gourmet, Newsweek, GQ, Travel and Leisure, Bon Appetit, Gastronomica, and lots more. His lect he lectures widely, and he has a devoted following among many of us right in this room for the series of conversations with luminaries of the opera that he conducts just down the street at Casa Italiana. And today he talks to us about the wisdom of age in the world of music and opera. And of course, for us at the IRP, we have a particular interest in matters related to longevity plus wisdom. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Fred Plotkin. Thank you, Miriam, and thanks to all of you. And I see familiar faces, and I see new faces. I learned a long time ago to not to say I see old faces, because that's a different <laughs> thing. But I see faces that I'm happy to see again. Um, 
In thinking about today's topic, for which I could stand here for 12 hours and talk to you, and I hope remain interesting for all the 12 hours, but how, what's the difference between creating well into old age and understanding the importance of being creative? Because not everyone is given the gift or the opportunity of creating masterpieces into old age, but nonetheless, it doesn't mean that we let go of our creativity. And I think that an important point to start at is the notion that almost all of us don't know how much time we have. But there's a yardstick that has been given to us by, of all people, Dante Alighieri, when he wrote in the Divine Comedy at the age of 35 that he was at the mezzo cammin della vita, in other words, halfway through his life. So he told us that we will live 70 years. He died at 61. So therefore, he broke his own rule. But somehow that notion has stuck that we get 70 years and everything else is a gift. Um, that notion influenced, in different ways, the four great visual artists of the great Italian, of the late Italian Renaissance. Michelangelo Buonarroti, Titian, Leonardo da Vinci, and Raphael, Raffaello Sanzio. Now, Raphael lived exactly to the day 37 years. And he left us a phenomenal amount of great art. Um, his biographer said that he died of amatory excess. <laughs> And he lived briefly, but he lived well. <laughs> and Leonardo da Vinci lived more or less to Dante's age, around 60. And he was incredibly creative, obviously. He sort of set the gold standard for creativity. But he did not complete many of his projects. He was distracted. He had the situation in which he lived for 25 years in one place and could do what he wanted, was given basically free reign like a genius grant to sit around and draw and create and doodle and so on. What we have of his is great. The notebooks are fascinating, and he was so nutty that he wrote them upside down and backwards so that people couldn't read them unless they knew to hold up a mirror. But if we talk about what, Leon what Leonardo left us, there's not that much, really. He left a great idea about creativity, and he left more things than most people could ever conceive of, and he had lots of great first drafts. Helicopters, bridges. He did design a lot of the canals that connect northern Italy, all the rivers of northern Italy, to the Mediterranean Sea. Michelangelo, who mistakenly, I believe, has always said he never finished anything, was obsessive about finishing everything. But he lived in a time in his long lifespan of 89 years, just shy of 89 years, when he had 13 popes in his lifetime. And every time you get a new pope, they say, don't do what the dead pope wanted, do what I want. Because these popes were all old guys and they wanted everything done right away. So Michelangelo had this buildup of projects. It was one thing that he worked on that he would not let go of for 45 years until he finished it, because even though the pope was long dead, he believed that he had to finish it. So please put out of your minds this notion that Michelangelo was not a finisher. Titian, I believe, and many people believe, was certainly the greatest Italian painter of all time, and maybe the greatest painter of all time, we could add. Velasquez and, and Rembrandt and Klimt and a few other people, but certainly Titian is up there as a fabulous painter. And because he was such a fabulous painter, everybody vied to pay him a lot of money. So I'm not saying that Titian worked for money, but Titian knew his value and got money. Michelangelo saved every penny that he ever got, and he was very cheap and he walked around in rags and dirty clothes and didn't wash because he was so obsessed with working. Because for Michelangelo and for other people I'm gonna to mention today, there was this inner imperative, this creative imperative that said, I must work. If I wake, he said, if I wake up in the morning, I have to work. 
And one of the great crises of his life came in the last week of his life because he had a brief final illness, but he knew that he was dying. And it was a Sunday. And in his view, that was the Lord's day and he was supposed to not work. And that day he was supposed to be religious, but he knew it might be his last Sunday and his last working day and he died on a Monday. And so he put aside his rules and he worked and he sculpted on the day before he died. So that's how focused he was on work. Not for the money, just because he had to answer that inner need. Raphael, amazing talent, amazing dexterity, amazing charm, was a different type of person and he never understood the length of years, but he understood his glory and his power. So we have different things here. We have work with Michelangelo, money, with Titian, where his genius and his unmatched talent was acknowledged. Leonardo, creativity, but not with the sense of I must complete something. And Raphael, I give a different word to, and it's not a negative word, dazzle. There are certain creative artists and people that we encounter who dazzle us without trying. Lady Gaga can dazzle you. She happens to have talent but there's something dazzling about her and that's what we see first and people don't then see into her talent unless they really look. But I believe that because we don't know how much time we have, we have to look at different approaches to how to use our time. So I'm presenting from art the four models, work, money, creativity, and dazzle, but now I'm gonna switch into music, but keep the concept of work, money, creativity, and dazzle. I have no negative judgment on any of the four, and I don't think you should either. Let's start with the so-called class of 1685. You had Bach, Vivaldi, and Handel, and Telemann, we don't count him, all born in that same year. Bach, well, Scarlatti too, but we're not gonna count him today. Uh, he's not quite up at the level of Bach, Vivaldi, and, and Handel. Bach, I would put down, if I had to categorize, and it's always not a good idea to narrowly categorize genius, but he was in the creativity category, along with Leonardo. Um, Vivaldi was definitely in the dazzle category. He was red-bearded and quite the ladies' man and so on, and very charming, but also a brilliant composer and very industrious. Handel was more in the Michelangelo line of work of answering that inner imperative. And they lived relatively long. They lived into their 60s. And Bach had 20 children, so he was productive in that way too. Um, and Handel had no children. Handel had no family, like Michelangelo had no family, uh, except for a few relatives who wanted his money. Um, and therefore, Handel's focus was in on the work, in on creating, in on the sense of I, I have so much in my head that I have to get down on paper and I have to get out into the instruments. Whereas Bach had, a, like Titian, sort of a steady job in a way, or Leonardo really, and every Sunday he had to crank out a cantata. He did masses, he did oratorios, and all the things that he did. But that's not to knock him but he went in the direction of let's see what I can do with music. Let's see, <coughs> excuse me, what language I can create with music. Vivaldi was dazzled. He was a marvelous public figure. Um, he played around with every woman and every girl in Venice until he was thrown out of Venice and then went to Vienna, then went to Amsterdam, stopped in Germany all the time while playing around and having a good time, and there's nothing wrong with having a good time, believe me. We're not supposed to suffer in our lives, we only get one life. So the idea is that he worked hard and he played hard, and that's not a bad thing. Now, but those guys were of a different era. They were built on the older models, and I think the first modern example that I'd like to point out is the most undervalued composer of all, Franz Josef Haydn. Haydn had work, money, creativity, and dazzle. He had all four things, and that makes him rather distinct in the history of creative art. But 
he basically had this lovely sinecure in Eisenstadt, and he composed for the, the Esterhazy family, and they kept him there. <coughs> this is asthma. And he produced, and he created, and he invented the sonata. He's the father of the symphony. He was dazzling. He had a sense of humor, which is not easy to come by in that world. He was very funny. And sometimes he was so funny and charming that he was not taken seriously, which is a strange thing. And it's a value that's handed down that composers such as Haydn and Rossini, who are fantastic geniuses, are belittled by the critical and public mind because they had humor, as if humor was something not serious. In other words, they were not Bach, they were not Michelangelo, they were, Michelangelo was not funny, but he was great. But there's nothing wrong with humor. Mozart had humor, and Raphael had humor, and Haydn certainly had humor. But what's so interesting is he was the greatest composer of his age. He was born in 1732. Mozart was born in 1756. Haydn, for all of his gifts and his accomplishment, understood that Mozart was at a different level from him and from anyone, including Bach who, and Handel, who had come before them. And therefore, Haydn, with great generosity, mentored Mozart and was very kind to Mozart and through Mozart work and wrote letters of recommendation because Mozart I put in the Raphael category of dazzle. So again, nothing wrong with dazzle. You can be a genius. But he lived fast. He died young. And he nonetheless was extremely creative. He understood worlds of music and relationships of notes that we're still pulling apart and trying to understand. So I don't know had he lived to an old age, he would have given us more. I think maybe like George Gershwin, like certain other people, he left us with greatness and, and, and who knows what he could have created. That's just purely speculation. The other person who Haydn attempted to mentor was Ludwig van Beethoven, born in 1770. And Beethoven was more in the raging Michelangelo inner imperative category. And Beethoven felt that he had nothing to learn from Haydn. Never mind that the great Mozart had learned from Haydn, never mind that Haydn was really a marvelous person and very kind and generous, which was unusual. Um, nonetheless, Beethoven said, I have nothing to learn from you. And in 1792, at the age of 22, he basically wrote Haydn off, which was OK, because Mozart died in 1791. In 1790, Haydn, who had basically lived in Eisenstadt in this little town, about 90 minutes from Vienna, said, let's see if I can get a job elsewhere. And he was invited to come to London to be the next great composer after a handle to live in London and really produce in London. He wrote 12 symphonies in London, among the greatest symphonies ever written. He was paid phenomenally well. He was considered the greatest thing to arrive in London musically and otherwise because he was so charming and, and all that. Um, but then, when he reached, a, not an ancient age, but an older age, remember we're talking about then, not now, he was about 68, 69, 70, which, remember, Dante said we get 70 years. Um, Haydn said, I could stay in London, I could make a lot of money, I could live my happy life and my productive life, I can work when I want and have money, creativity, and dazzle, all of it. But he said no. And he went back to this little town of Eisenstadt. And to me, it's one of the great mysteries of the older age of, of, of a creative artist. Because he turned his back on everything flourishing and wonderful that we consider achievement. And said, I want to go back to where I've lived. He had a terrible marriage. It, that was not a good part of his life. His mistress, a long-term relationship, had died. The son that he and the mistress produced was in Italy. So therefore, there was nothing to go back to in Eisenstadt. And I think the question was, and, and there's no real answer that I can give you, did he go back out of familiarity, out of fear, 
or what I think perhaps is this homing instinct that for the completion of his tour, let's call it, of his life, that he wanted to be in the place where it all began and where so much was familiar. For him to live out his years in London and die in London, he would be in exile. The way Handel was in exile, the way so many people have moved from what, Stravinsky was in exile, we can name endless exiles. Rachmaninoff died in Los Angeles, and on and on and on and on. They all think of home. Prokofiev was someone who decided, I know it's the Soviet Union, I know that I'm considered a renegade here, but he went back and lived and suffered in the Soviet Union, and even had the misfortune to die on the very same day as Stalin. And there, 1953, in March of 1953, and therefore, no headline, Prokofiev dead, it's Stalin dead. Prokofiev died, one of the great composers, anonymously, and lived out his years rather anonymously and without the glory that could have come to him. And that was the same thing that happened to Haydn. Now, we're going to go to his two mentees, to Mozart, who did not live long, and to Beethoven, who lived 57 years, which in that time, okay, it's not quite what Dante prescribed. But Mozart, from the beginning, was dazzling. He was the dazzler. He had an incredible amount of creativity. We always think of him as poor. Mozart actually made a lot of money, but he spent a lot of money. And he was a gambler. And if you go to his house in Vienna, you can see his gambling table there in the room. He gambled away most of his money. Mozart, too, had this work imperative, like Michelangelo and like, and like Haydn. And so every day he would wake up just because there was so much to get out of his pores and out of his pen. He worked on the few commissions that he got. But as you know, he didn't get too many commissions. And I'd like to debunk for you one of the most famous commissions in musical history, the Requiem. If you saw uh, Amadeus, and if you read some of these biographies, you would think that someone came to Mozart and said, I'd like to write you a, a Requiem. And a big exclamation point went off above Mozart's head, hey, I'm dying, so this is my Requiem. That really was not the case. Mozart was work for hire, and he had no money at that point. He had terrible debts. His wife was trying to keep things together. She was not the ninny depicted in Amadeus. She was a very bright woman. She had lost four of her six children. They were desperately trying to keep their two other children alive. And it was a very dire situation in the Mozart household. So any work that came in, he would write. And the commission was from a man who wanted a requiem for his own wife, but he couldn't compose. So in effect, Mozart would write the Requiem, and the man would put it under his name. We all know, of course, that uh, Mozart wrote part of the Requiem, and then he died at the Lacrimosa, at the tearful part. But another fiction about Mozart is that his last opera was the Magic Flute. It was not. It was the last opera performed, but it was not the last opera composed. And I think that the opera that we need to understand better, and it's incredibly undervalued by Mozart, is La Clemenza di Tito, The Clemency of Titus, which he wrote on commission for Archduke Joseph, who was Emperor Joseph, who was going to be crowned again. Vienna was not good enough. He had to be crowned in Prague in August of 1791. Mozart died in December, December 5th, 1791. So, Mozart wrote this on commission, but he was deeply inspired by the story of Titus Vespasian, the Roman emperor, who had plots against him, whose whole world fell apart, basically. Everything that could go wrong, he had a lot of surus, if they didn't say that in ancient Rome, but anything that could go wrong for Titus went wrong. Anything that could go wrong for Mozart went wrong. And for that reason, Mozart invested musically and emotionally a great deal in the character of Titus. Now, I don't know how many of you are regular opera goers, but I always tell opera lovers that when you are watching a scene from an opera, you read the words, yes, but that's a modern addition. The main information that comes to you, the emotional information and the dramatic information, comes in the music. 
So when I play you now a segment at the end of La Clemenza di Tito, which was Mozart's last operatic statement, and opera was his medium. He said if he could, he would only be an opera composer. This is his last message to us, to read the words, but listen what he's telling us in the music. Loading it was not Mozart's message. Okay. A che giorno hai mai questo? Al punto i stesso che assolvono reo, ne scopro un altro.
Now, when in South Africa in the 1990s, Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and other people came to be in charge there, they looked back to Titus Vespasian as an example of what became, in effect, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, if you remember that. Let me just put this on pause. And therefore, Mozart was saying, in effect, that we may not be dealt a good hand. Nelson Mandela was in prison for 27 years. He came out of prison. He could have sought such revenge against everyone. But he decided instead clemency, forgiveness, moving forward. The message that Mozart is giving us here, and I think it's a very important one, is life ain't easy. But nonetheless, if we focus so much on resentment, on regret, on the what if, we are depriving and harming ourselves more than anyone else. So he reapplied himself each day to creating and was able, despite four dead children and poverty and everything else, to focus on the creativity, on the dazzle, if you wish, because he understood that it improved him as a person and perhaps by connection would be better for the rest of his family. Similarly, Nelson Mandela understood, if I hang on to the hatred, we will continue to promote hatred. We will continue to promote division, and then my struggle, my 27 years on Robbins Island, would have been for naught. Beethoven, who basically followed in Mozart's footsteps, but really followed no one's footsteps, he plowed his own road all the time, he always took the more difficult path, in effect said that I don't care about the outside world. I don't care what people think of me. Interestingly, he, like Michelangelo, was physically very dirty, not interested in food, not interested in pleasure. He was so focused on answering that inner imperative. And we don't all have that inner imperative, but if we do, it's there all the time saying, what about me? Don't forget me. And if, we happen, if some of you happen to be a person with that inner imperative, if you don't answer it, you're doing yourself harm. And Beethoven and Michelangelo, who were rude and obnoxious and raging and all that, nonetheless understood that they had a responsibility to that inner imperative, that call it a gift, call it whatever you want, they had to answer it. And it was their job to get up in the morning, no matter how awful they felt, and to answer that imperative again. What is, of course, fascinating and tragic about Beethoven is here he was, a musician, and he went deaf, and he went deaf very early on. By 1805, he was born in 1770, he was mostly deaf. But by 1805, he was just finishing his opera, Fidelio. He had not yet written the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth symphonies. He had not yet written certain piano concerti. He had not yet written many songs. Well, we don't know about Beethoven. He had a rather bawdy sense of humor. But because he couldn't hear anyone else and no one would pay attention to him, the bawdy sense of humor was channeled inward. And in his very late life, when he couldn't hear at all, he nonetheless found the ability to laugh by writing in the Diabelli Variations. I don't know how many of you saw the play last year with Jane Fonda, but a play about variations, about taking something essential and teasing it out, not just as an exercise, but testing your means of expression. <coughs> and Beethoven did that. And some of the Diabelli Variations are very serious, some of them are very beautiful, and some of them are kind of funny. But at the very end of his working life, Beethoven went to a place musically and creatively that we're still trying to sort out. I would like you to think of the music I'm going to play as the equivalent of Michelangelo getting up on the last Sunday of his life, staggering over to a piece of marble and sculpting. And by the way, that sculpture is called the Rondanini Pietà, and it's in Milan. 
And most people who go to Milan and see the Last Supper and go to La Scala, they do not go to the Rondonini Pietà and the Forza Castle. And next time you're in Milan, make a beeline there. This is Michelangelo's last artistic statement. And just for that, you need to see it. And it's fantastic, too. But Beethoven, similarly, was sculpting with smaller materials. He didn't use his big orchestra. He wrote string quartets that we call the late quartets. And I'm going to play you just a few minutes of the music, and I implore you not to try to understand it, because we in our modern times are so analytical that the act of analyzing, we actually miss out on what the message often is. So let's hear this and just picture Beethoven sculpting on a piece of marble. continue with that, but based on the music you heard, could any of you, and you can call it out one after the next, apply a word that Beethoven may have affixed to it himself? He and his quartets didn't name things like Eroica or Ode to Joy, but this movement of the last string quartet he actually gave a name to. What emotion did it evoke for you? Mournful, sorrow, plaintive, mourning, longing. What was that one? Elegiac? Okay. All right. Well, that's what we heard, and that's the interpretation that we put on it. He called it Thanksgiving. It's funny to see that word for our holiday, but he called it Thanksgiving. And he further said, Thanksgiving for a sick man. Because what he meant was that here I am, deaf, very sick. He had all kinds of you know, 18th century, 19th century maladies that we don't even know from anymore. Everything you know, breaking down at all ends. And nonetheless, thanksgiving that he could still write and that he could still create. So that music for him in his deaf and sick state was positive. And the message that Beethoven said at the end was the fact that I can still do, in whatever form I'm asked to do it, what I was meant to do is similar to Michelangelo saying, I'm sorry, God, I know I'm supposed to worship you on Sunday, but I have to work. 
and going to sculpt. And when people understand that they have this imperative, as I said before, and they recognize that they are able to respond to it, that is something to be incredibly thankful for. And Beethoven, miraculously, was thankful to the very end. He was not bitter. He was not that raging, angry guy with the wild hair that we think of. He was that too, but actually earlier. But as he got older and as he withdrew from the world because he couldn't hear the world anymore, he replaced it with his own values. And the interesting message that I get from Beethoven is, if your values are noble, as his ultimately were, if your values are those of kindness, of positivity, of creativity, and if you can apply that to your every waking day and the hours that you're given, we don't know how many they are, we are living well. Now, despite the suffering, sometimes the suffering informs how well we can live because it gives us something to juxtapose. Um, I'm going to fast forward about two centuries, but then I'm going to go back to the 19th century for the end of my talk. Richard Strauss and Leos Janáček, along with Puccini, I believe were the three great opera composers of the 20th century. And when I wrote Opera 101, I didn't yet know Janáček well enough to rank him along with Puccini and Strauss. Now I definitely do. Um, Janacek wrote an opera that's currently playing in the San Francisco Opera, and if you happen to be going to San Francisco in these days, do not miss it. It comes to the Met infrequently, it comes around infrequently in general. It's called the Macropolis Affair. You thought I was going to say from the House of the Dead, but no. The Macropolis Affair. How many of you have seen it or know the opera? Okay. It's a story of a 337-year-old woman. She was born in 1585, and we know that she dies in 1922. Her initials throughout her many iterations are E.M., Emilia Marti, Ellen of Macropolis, and many, many more, Ellen McPherson, everything. She's a person who, by some fluke in 1585, was given a drug that gives her eternal life. And when we meet her in the opera, it's around 1922, so a modern opera, and she's looking for more of this stuff because she thinks it'll run out after 337 years. But as she realizes that her children, grandchildren, and so on, everyone has died and all of her lovers are gone, and while she stays eternally youthful, the men that she has, she's had a lot of sex in her life, Every guy grows very old, and then he's gone. And in effect, everything that she knew as E.M. ultimately left her. And what she realizes is immortality is no great thing. And that immortality means that we don't have an awareness of our mortality, and therefore we don't have an awareness of the value of life in every day. If you were to be able to go on and on and on and on, you wouldn't set your schedule in the same way. You wouldn't prioritize. You wouldn't understand that life is a gift, that it's, it's for savoring and not simply enduring. So to me, the worst expression in the English language, apart from tea party, <laughs> is killing time. When people say I'm killing time, it makes me sick to my stomach because it's so precious. And Amelia Marti, Ellen Macropolis, L. McPherson, kills a lot of time. But then suddenly, she's faced with the fact that she can have more of the serum, but realizes that her life won't mean anything if it doesn't have an end point. And she doesn't quite commit suicide, but she doesn't take any more of the serum. And she takes the antidote to the serum, and suddenly, as she ages in front of us, 337 years in about eight minutes, this magnificent scene of wisdom comes forth, this sense that time is something. Titian understood that time was something. Titian, fantastic painter, but he began to go blind late in life, as did Rembrandt, but Rembrandt was 63 and Titian was 87. Um, Titian continued to paint because he said, now I see differently. And E.M., Macropolis, 
says, now I see differently. It's the same thing. She could have all the money and all the power, but without the awareness of her own frailty, her life has no meaning. So I commend that opera to you. And it was something, it sort of set the tone for the 20th century and a lot of the horrors of the 20th century that life became cheap, cheaper. And only later on did we value certain human experiences. We're getting away from that. I mean, Facebook and things like that are great for connecting, but if you then don't use it, and if you don't really make conversation work, and if you don't make contact meaningful, having a, a whole bunch of Facebook friends has no meaning. Similarly, giving out business cards at a cocktail party, if you don't have meaningful conversation, that's killing time. Richard Strauss had the benefit of a long life and, and very good health. And he was born in 1864. He wrote tone poems. He wrote amazing songs. He wrote fantastic operas and a couple of bad operas, I think, but really some of the best operas, too. He had a strained relationship with his wife. And if you go to the New York City Opera now and see Intermezzo, it's the story of him and his wife. And nonetheless, there was love, there was appreciation, there was understanding. Given that he lived through two world wars, saw the destruction of Germany, was named perhaps as a Nazi sympathizer. Um, at the end of World War II in 1945, everything around him was rubble. But nonetheless, he decided that he didn't have any more huge statements to make. He looked at Beethoven's quartets and he said, well, I'm not gonna write that, but I would like to write four last songs. Now, I want to emphasize for you that these are not the four last songs. These are four last songs. It's a huge difference, that article, because these are not the four last songs he wrote. He wrote another one after them. But these are four last songs, meaning four songs that come at the end. And in the music, not just in the words, and frankly, the song I'm gonna play for you, I'm not even gonna read the words, I'm just gonna play the music, and I want you to listen how he narrates in a Clemenza di Tito type way, but without the sense of clemency. It's acceptance, it's awareness of life is very hard. But even in falling leaves in September, there is a beauty to the falling leaves. There's a beauty to the shorter days, to the dimming light, to the different colors, to the stronger sensations, to the chill in the air. And what Strauss tells us in part in this song is, we don't look for beauty. There is so much beauty around us and we look at the ugly and we focus on the ugly. And it's not to say that the ugly is not there, it's there, but if we do not nourish ourselves with beauty, then the ugly will overtake us.
Now, I referred to elements of September without telling you that the song is called September. And Strauss's four last songs are performed in a particular order when they're performed as a group. He did not intend for them to be performed as a group. And September is performed second, but of the four songs, it was the last one he wrote. So really, in a way, an expression of the last statement. Let me cue this for you, if I may. There's no disc, and there is a disc in there. Right? That was Lisa Della Casa. And the reason I picked that slightly old, loopy recording is because it was done in Strauss's time and reflects more closely the way he envisioned the sound and the performance than our more streamlined, often less profound performances that we hear now. And I wanted you to... <laughs> Let me leave that for the moment. Anyway, we have to go back a bit to the late 19th century to my hero, Giuseppe Verdi. Verdi had the work imperative of Michelangelo and the temper. He made a phenomenal amount of money. He was incredibly creative. And I wouldn't say that he dazzled in quite the same way that Mozart and Raphael and certain other people did. But nonetheless, and Vivaldi, but nonetheless, he was dazzling because he was such a, an amazing presence. This is the man who was born in 1813 in a little town in near Parma. We always say he's from Parma. He actually was from closer to Cremona. His parents ran a trattoria, and he knew good food. And but he lived out in the country. He was in effect a farmer, and. It was also his trattoria, his family's trattoria was so good that every postal wagon taking mail from Milan to Parma and further south stopped at the Verdi's because the food was so good. And Verdi, as a young man out in the country, met all these people. And at a certain point, he asked them to bring books so that Verdi, who started really with nothing, he was poor, he had no formal education except learning to read and write, at the church across the street from where he lived, became self-educated. He read the Greeks, he read Dante, he read Shakespeare. He saw images of the art of Michelangelo and Titian and Raphael, and he understood the greatness of Italian creativity. And he understood that he presently, at his time, lived under Austrian domination. And other parts of Italy were under France, and other parts of Italy were under Spain, and other parts of Italy were under the papacy. So therefore, Italy was not a nation. And in his view, his greatest contribution would have to be, in effect, being the George Washington of Italy, of bringing his country together, of creating a place with all of that heritage and all of that legacy that he didn't see, but that he knew about. He understood the power of culture as a message. He understood the power of culture to inspire and to ennoble and something that should be available to everyone. And he understood that he could lead war and battles and revolution from the stages of La Scala, La Fenice, Naples, Florence, wherever his operas went. They were meant to tell Italians, you're under the yoke of someone else now, but you will rise above it. Verdi, when he began to do that, his wife, his two children died in 18 months, within 18 months of typhus. He was horrified by that. He was in his 30s. He worked constantly. He felt, OK, a bit like Michelangelo, my mission is this. My mission, I was put here for a different purpose, and maybe I'm not meant to have a family. And years later, he fell in love with an opera singer, and she with him named Giuseppina Strapponi. They lived, quote, in sin for 17 years, which was just not done at the time. Verdi, depending who you talk to, was a religious man, an atheist, or an agnostic. And the fact that everybody can read him so differently means that he has a universality, and he speaks to everyone. And he wrote this amazing requiem mass that probably cannot be touched. He wrote phenomenal operas of great tragedy, of seriousness. To me, the greatest opera of all time 
and you're hearing this off the record, even though it's being recorded on camera, is his Don Carlo, which is opening at the Met on November 22nd, a new production. Nothing can touch it. It's about politics. It's about the church. It's about private life versus public responsibility. It's about the burdens we're given, the burdens we shoulder, and what we do with them. And so I encourage you all to go see Don Carlo. It's just, there's nothing like it. It's longish, but you don't feel it. And Verdi lived with Straponi, they married, they had a child, but because of the restrictions of the time, the child was born before they were married, the child was sent for adoption. But who adopted this child? It was sent across the river to Cremona, across the Po River, but the Verdi's had the daughter Maria adopted by the next door neighbors. So Verdi and Straponi supervised and it educated this girl and did everything but say, we're your mother and father. And she lived across the fence, but she ate at the Verdi's and she knew Mr. and Mrs. Verdi incredibly well. And it's, it's, she never knew though in her lifetime that these were her parents, because such were the strictures of the time. So that was a sadness for Verdi. And if you think of all the father-daughter relationships in his operas, and there are so many about that slight absence of communication despite great love that was born of the relationship with Maria. Straponi at a certain point died. Verdi probably had a relationship with a woman named Teresa Stoltz who was the first Aida, uh, but Straponi didn't seem to mind. And as he became a very old man, his, everything had gone wrong. He had, he had founded Italy in effect Italy became the Italy of governments of revolving chairs that we still see today. There was no Berlusconi, thankfully, <laughs> but it was not great. And it was a monarchy, but the, the monarchs were disappointing, and Verdi basically withdrew and became a farmer. And late in life, he was seduced out by a young, talented man named Arrigo Boito, who sent him the play Othello, and in effect convinced Verdi that you now don't have to lead a country, you don't have to do all of this, but you still have your musical talent, and why not? See what you can do with it. And as a result of doing that, that was actually not Otello. Um, <laughs> as a result of doing that, um, Verdi said, okay, I've written my crowning ma masterpiece, even Wagner is jealous of me now, and that seemed to be it. And Verdi's wife died, and, and all of his friends died, and he outlived everyone, and except his old friend Boito, who was much younger. And Boito understood that Verdi still had something else to say. And if we put Verdi on the shelf, in effect, and said that he has nothing else to contribute, then he wouldn't, and that would be our loss. And Verdi felt that I can't do it again, I have nothing else to say. And Boito understood Verdi's weakness and he, he served him pork shoulder. And Verdi loved pork shoulder and had his own recipe that he would send out. And Verdi said, well, let's have a glass of wine. And the wine started flowing. And Boito said, you know, you remind me of Sir John Falstaff. Who? <laughs> Verdi knew who Falstaff was, and you're still attractive, you're still interesting, you're still all that. Now, Boito wrote the words, but it was Verdi who gave it great music. And it was, however, Verdi who said to Boito, I would like to do something I've never done before, and that is one of the key messages is, you don't have to repeat what you've done. He said, I want to do something new that I've never done before. I don't want arias. I'd like to write a fugue, in other words, like Bach, a collective body of voices in which we're all together but all distinct. And it was Verdi who wrote out the words, tutto il mondo è burla, all the world is a joke. And you can call that cynical, you can call it wise, you can call it lighthearted, but Verdi's last statement was not the statement of an individual, but the statement of people in general. And if you understand that ultimately our life's journey 
for all of the challenges and the richnesses and the beauty and the suffering and so on, if you are more lighthearted about it. Mozart was accepting and forgiving. Verdi said, no, that's OK. But it's better to ultimately come out laughing. And so he wrote for his last artistic statement. It's a very old man, very, very old, still writing, still creating, um, Tout le monde est burla. Now, this would be a joke if it didn't play. <laughs> after the age of 90, that Verdi said everything he had to say. But he realized something very important that Haydn realized that not too many other people realized about your legacy. And Verdi understood that his operas were great not because of his genius, but because of the people who performed in them. And the fact that musicians who live a very precarious life, who are always being judged, who if they wake up with a cold if you're a singer or a flutist or you've cut your finger and you're a violinist or a pianist, these little things can change your whole situation. And Verdi understood that we're only as strong as our weakest link. And therefore, it was his responsibility, he felt, to look after other musicians, taking the wealth that he had accumulated through his life and he did look after his daughter, Maria, although she only later found out why. But 
he built something in Milan that he called La Mia Opera Più Bella, my most beautiful work, because opera in Italian is not just opera lirica, the opera we, we love, but it means any kind of work. And he said, my be most beautiful work was a Casa di Riposo per Musicisti, a rest home that was built for musicians. Now, it's not a rest home where they flop, but it's a place where they can continue to make music. And he put pianos and instruments in every room. And he created theaters in there. And I've visited there. And if any of you have been there, you know how fantastic it is. And his belief was that these musicians gave everything they could in their way to their capacity, to their art, to their lives. They got up every day for the work. They did not do it like Titian for the money, although it would be nice. They explored the creativity, but often the creativity of others rather than their own creativity. And they were, in the most part, able to impart a certain degree of dazzle. And nonetheless, Verdi, we would say, is more in the Michelangelo, Beethoven working line of you have this imperative. But unlike the others, he understood that it is your responsibility to pass it on. And it's your responsibility to acknowledge how fortunate you are even when things seem bad and make things better for someone else. So to this day, the Casa di Riposo for Musicisti in Milan is the home to musicians who are no longer active practicing musicians. And very intelligently, they took Verdi's message. And now young Americans and Koreans and South Africans and people from everywhere go as young people and live in the home so that the older people pass down the legacy, the culture of Verdi and Puccini and everyone else. They teach, but at the same time, they have the company, the companionship, the friendship of these young people. And Verdi understood that by passing on knowledge and love, it's what you get back. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions. I'll be glad to take questions. In the back. You use the word dazzle many, many times. Would you please define it? The question is, I use the word dazzle many, many times. I hope not too many times. And would I define it? Dazzle, in my view, is not hoodwinking, it's not fake, it's the human spark. It's something that we all have, but too many of us, whether for training in our homes, in religions, in schools, we hide our light a bit. And it's a wonderful human experience to be with other people, even if you don't speak their languages. I've traveled many countries, and you meet someone who just has the spark. And even though you cannot communicate in anything but a kiss and a hug, you nonetheless recognize that human torch. And when you see it in another, it, it illumines your own torch. And that's what I mean by dazzle. It doesn't mean that you're fake. I mean, Raphael, Mozart were geniuses and, and as good at their work as what anyone could be. But they also had unmistakably that spark of humanity that's different from the spark of genius. You're shaking your head no. You don't agree. Well, take a microphone and tell me, please. Your dazzle has a negative into the mic, and you're, you're reversing that. Well, take a microphone so everyone can hear what you're saying, please. I would like to know why you chose the word dazzle. To upset you, actually. It was <laughs> <laughs> um, no, because I wanted to restore a word that has gained negativity as a context to something positive. When something is dazzling, that fugue was dazzling. It's not negative. It's dazzling in its execution. It's the fact that all those voices can merge. It's one of the hardest things to perform. And when people do it well, as James Levine and his singers did, it's dazzling. So that's my view, but you're allowed to disagree. Another question. Sir, you with a hand up. Hold on. You were alluding to cultural. At least you would evaluate. Uh, it's all right. Peter Gelb, uh, definitely uh, in reference to high definition, this new ad 
Advent, uh, your evaluation of Mr. Gelb. Uh, he's been criticized, I believe, as Tasker and high definition. He's been praised. I mean, your evaluation in terms of cultural manure. Well, manure. this talk is about the wisdom of old age, and I'm only 54, <laughs> and he's 56. But my evaluation is that he is evaluated by everyone who has their sense of what opera is supposed to be. He is doing what he thinks opera is supposed to be, and he feels, and he said it too often for my taste, that it's a dying art form, that the audience is dying, that everything is dying, and I don't agree with him one bit. Um, he, and this is again my opinion, he is much better musically than we give him credit for. He has brought in phenomenal conductors to the Met, and that's something that's not acknowledged. And we had um, William Christie the other night, we had Simon Rattle coming, we've had phenomenal conductors. So I don't feel that there's been any erosion in the orchestra or the chorus. There's a wonderful new chorus master there, Donald Palumbo. Um, I feel that there are certain singers in the world that I would love to see at the Met who are not there. And I actually asked him a few months ago, what new singers, and I used the word new, would he like to bring to the Met? And he said, Cecilia Bartley. And I want to say, well, she sung at the Met. And we love Cecilia Bartley, but her voice is not big enough for that opera house. Um, we need to understand that it's a very hard thing to put on one opera production. The Met does 27 a year. He does a lot of new productions. He's very ambitious. And some work, some don't. But that was the same in the Volpe era and the Bing era and the Crawford era. And we forget that because we only remember the successes. Um, for example, Donizetti wrote 70 operas. How many operas by Donizetti do we hear typically? We're lucky to hear 10. I'd love to hear the other 60. But they have been judged failures by history, and therefore they're hard to dig out. Um, I think that the HD format has pluses and minuses. I think that the pluses are that it brings opera immediately to people who otherwise couldn't get to it. The minuses are several. One is, when we go to any theatrical or musical performance, we decide what to look at and what to focus on. A television director is making that decision for you, and I feel that in some cases there have been bad choices, so for example, La Sonambula, the mad scene where we really wanted to watch the character who was having her mad scene, we instead saw a lot of reaction shots like, oh my, she's nuts. When that's not what we need to see, we need to focus on the woman who's having a mad scene. But that's a directorial choice and that could be fixed. Another thing, and it's not Gelb's fault at all, but any time you have opera on video, People tend to focus more on the words and the images and less on the music, which is why I said to you with La Clemenza di Tito, listen, the message is in the music first, but that comes through education. So mixed bag, I could, I could say a lot more, but I think that ultimately what we have to always remember is, to me, the breaking point would be if opera singers were given microphones because it's natural sound. The amazing thing is the natural sound. And although I could have spoken to you without a mic today, it's being recorded on camera, and that's why I'm speaking in a mic. But there's something very different about natural sound that is very human. It's dazzle. It's that contact that the human voice has that very few other things have, because ultimately that is our biggest expression our mood, our, all the colors that we produce come out of the voice. Right here. By definition, those of us who are here today can get access uh, uh, to the Metropolitan Opera, and obviously we enjoy it in that form. I personally don't go and see the films, but the number of people around the world who now have access to it, and they think that they're listening in live time, you know? It's just amazing how it has spread the word of the Met everywhere. It has, and that's very positive. But um, one thing I do want to add to that that I left out, not intentionally, but I just forgot to say it, is 
One thing that I'm going to monitor is how many opera companies fail as a result of these. In the United States, we've had five historic companies fold in the past couple of years. It may be for economics, but when they've interviewed people saying, how come you no longer go to the opera in Baltimore and Orlando and Orange County and Hartford? They often say, well, because we pay $22 to go to the Met at the movies, as they call it, and therefore we don't have to go to our opera company more. And if in the act of changing the art form to spread it that way, we're killing off the live art form, that's not a good thing. And I'm not saying that that's what these do, but I do know many people around who don't make the connection of, gee, I liked opera so much on screen, let me go to the opera in Toronto and Austin and any other place. There is growth in opera, and it's actually an art form that grows faster than a lot of the others, including for young people. But I just want to make sure that video doesn't become the default medium for going to the opera. Another qu right here. The question is, do I think that Gelb is emphasizing and trying to bring out more the sexual interest and the, the sexiness of the characters of the singers? And isn't that a bad thing, I think is what you're asking. No, I think. <laughs> but I do want to say that it's not his idea. He didn't invent that. Opera has been sexy since day one. And if we think of it as a powdery museum art, we're really not getting what opera is. The Marriage of Figaro, or Cosi Fan Tutte, or Don Giovanni, are not sex farces. That's reality opera. It's about the human impulse and how variable it could be. I went to see Cosi Fan Tutte the other night at the Met, and it's such a phenomenal work that we dismiss as a sex farce. It's about how we interact. And it's so ingenious because it does not lay down cut and dried hard rules that boy goes with girl and this and that. It says we are all sexual beings and we have our impulses and our confusions and so on and so forth at every age, actually, which is an important message in that opera too, as in Linozza di Figaro. And therefore, no. Um, there are very few unsexy operas. Boris Godunov is not a sexy opera. It's a fantastic opera. It's one of the greatest. Don Carlo has sexiness in it, but it's not the main th theme. Um, it's about passion denied and, and the impact and how negative that could be. But no, I don't think that he's making singers do something that they wouldn't naturally do. I know singers. It comes naturally to them, believe me. <laughs> Other questions? Anyone else? Well, then thank you all so much.